Hey, everybody. Randy Patterson here with Boomerosity. Boy, oh boy, oh boy, do I have a fun interview for you. Oh my gosh. I had so much fun conducting this interview with the legendary Genya Raven. Oh my Lord. It was just pure rock and roll treat, pure rock and roll heaven. And odds are you may not have heard of her unless you're just really into musicology, really into the history of rock and roll, which if you are, then you're going to love this because you'll know who she is. You'll know the, the vast impact on music history, rock and roll history that this wonderful woman has had. You may also recognize her from her shows on Sirius XM, and that's uh, Goldie's Garage and Chicks and Broads. Both uh, are ideas of hers after she was invited as a guest on Little Steven's show. And so anyway, this was a audio call. My side was video, but she called in. And uh, I, I hope you don't let that stop you because what she has to say is amazing. Just, just glimpses, little small glimpses into some key moments of recording history. And more importantly, I think is the impact that this woman has had on trying to make the business of rock and roll more women friendly. I mean, why, why, why in an industry that's supposed to be so, you know, um, activist oriented and speaking about peace and love, are we still having to talk about women's equality in the business? And yet here's Genya still preaching it after all these years. So we talk about that. We talk about some of the songs. You're going to love those stories and rock and roll hall of fame and so on and so forth. There's a lot of name dropping and a little bit of raw language, but Hey, that's rock and roll, isn't it? So without any further ado, here's what I hope are many more interviews with the great Genya Raven until next time. This is Randy Patterson with Boomerosity. Take care. So how you doing, honey? I'm doing great. It's a beautiful day up here in the Smoky Mountains, and, yeah. uh, and I get to talk oh, to nice. a rock. I get to talk to a rock and roll legend. So I, the day is good. Uh, <laughs> legend is better than pioneer. I like that. Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're kind of both, aren't you? <laughs> well, yeah, kind of. We're getting awarded at the New England Hall of Fame um, on the thirtieth. Uh, Goldie and the Gingerbreads, my my very first band, and uh-huh. that's what we're getting an award for pioneering. <laughs> oh wow! Well, congratulations, well deserved. Well, thank you, darling. Well deserved. Yeah, a little overdue. I would yeah. I would say so. Yeah, absolutely. Little Stephen has been you know wanting us to get to Cleveland, and of course that's going to happen. But you need to be in there ahead of some of the people they've already put in there. That's what blows my mind. Uh, I tell me. <laughs> Tell me about it. That really makes me very, very angry. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I but, uh, years ago, I had a conversation uh, with Greg Harris, the CEO of the Rock uh, Hall, and uh, we we had a yeah. friendly conversation about some of the uh-huh. the, uh, the inductees and how they <laughs> how they got in and some didn't, you know, and I, yeah, I think, yeah. We just left it that we would disagree agreeably, you know, so <laughs> that's my story and I'm sticking to records. it. <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad you do. I'm glad you do. But, you know, they look for the people that have had big hits, you know. We we were the first. They don't know what to call us. They don't know what to do with us, and they never did, you well, know, so. Yeah, but still, gosh, Ginya, I mean. I know. You know, I that, know, darling. That, that, that doesn't I, mean that you put put hip hop in there. I mean, hip hop has yeah, their own rock exactly. and roll hall of fame. I mean, yes, they do. Yes, um, they do. Yeah. They, well, I you read, know, I say it's going to be coming. You know, because everyone I know that's involved says we've brought you up so many times, so many times. So someone's going to say, you know what? Yeah, let's do an, another kind of award. Yes. You yes. know. Um, they're doing that all the time, you know? Well, absolutely. So, but anyway, I'm a happy camper, baby. I'm good, you know? Well, good. That's that's half the battle right there, being content no matter what, isn't it? 
I am. I'm very content. I got, I got the best fans in the world. I've got, you know, I've got a great life right now. I work with Lil Steve. You know, it's just all of it is just, it's really mind blowing. You know how many fans I have and the letters that I get and what my music meant to them. Oh my God, you should, you should. You should see some of these, but I don't want to disclose them because, you know, they are private letters that I get right. from people. So, but uh, some of them, one of them said, you saved my life. Wow. Uh, you know, I mean, th- that was for shadow boxing, the oh, song goodness. from Urban Desire. Right. right. Um, shadow boxing. He says, you saved my life. Um, yeah. He, he was ready to take his life. He, sounded serious so you know why would anybody say that you know and then of course uh, the guests that i work with all the time you know like lou reed and ian hunter mick ronson you know i i love singing i come from the streets you know i come from the bar this is what's wrong with a lot of the groups not wrong i feel bad for them they don't have a place to shed you know, like they, we used to get gigs for six weeks at a time where we'd play every night till 4 a.m. There's your schooling right there, you know? Yep. That's why when we do sound checks, you know, I'm so lackadaisical about that because I go, listen, I worked in bowling alleys. This is fine. <laughs> you, know? you can hear me. You can hear me between strikes. This is really good. <laughs> so you got to really. You got to grow up in the business if you know it as well as I do, which is how I maintain staying in the business. You well, know, you know uh, I, so I was, I was listening to, to an interview the other day between um, Eddie mm-hmm. Trunk and Joe Bonamassa, and they were talking ah, about yeah. the state of the of the concert business today and how. I mean, uh, I, I guess I'm uh, fortunate. The shows I go to, it's real music and not not lip synced, but. Yeah. They were talking yeah. about shows where people are dropping the mics and there's no sound from the mic dropping. So that tells you there's lip syncing going on and all that kind of stuff. And oh I, I my just God. like, uh, what, what is, what's that all about? What, what happened to rock and roll? Exactly. Uh, you want to hear the best, you want to hear the best remark I've heard. And this is like recently, this girl said, I was at a barbecue and she came over and she goes, Kenya, we played your album and I mean it. And this guy turned around and he said, I think I've heard my very first rock and roll album. Wow. And he loves music. Uh But this was the first rock and roll. So those two albums really stand up, you know. So I'm I'm really glad that they're getting uh, released again. Well, that's what I was just getting ready to say. Congratulations on the re-release of those two. I mean, how exciting that must be for you. It, it is very exciting, honey. It is truly exciting because those are the first two that I actually really produced. Uh-huh. You know, I mean, my production, my production went from there to, to, you know, to the dead boys, to Ronnie Spector, to all of them, you know, but I was on both sides of the glass for many years, you know, in the mm-hmm. control room uh, mm-hmm. because no matter who produced me or Goldie and the gingerbreads, at least, I was always putting in the input and doing all the arrangements and everything mm-hmm. else. So, you know, it was uh, quite the learning experience and a, a great one. You couldn't get that in school. Oh, you I couldn't bet. get it today. You no. couldn't get that today. Hey. I, I, I I was weaned in bars singing. Uh huh. You know? With this. I'll never forget when I found my voice. It was just amazing. And liberating. I loved my voice. Very liberating. And it wasn't just the voice. I I discovered one time on stage that I can change a melody in a song because I was doing cover songs. Mm-hmm. We were all doing cover songs. You know, you couldn't get as good as I was and not do knock on wood, hold on, I'm coming and all of those from mm-hmm. from that era, the mm-hmm. 60s to the 70s radio. I mean, it was amazing. So I could change a melody. Holy cow. And stay on key in that. (laughs) Wow. Now that was some awakening. Yep. Yep. I can imagine. You know? Oh my God. And you're talking to, and you're talking to somebody that's got a brain like the sponge because I wasn't born here. I was born in Poland. Right. So when we came to the United States, I didn't know a word of English. So I learned English through music. 
<laughs> so I was being prepped all along. Yep. Wow. Condition you know, from the get-go. Through yep. radio. Wow. Yeah. It's pretty, uh, <laughs> have you read my book? No, I haven't. In fact, when I was going through this prep, I I, I was stunned that yeah. you had a book, and I wish I had had time to have ordered it and and read it. Oh, because... it's okay, it's right. okay. I'm I, I'm just reissuing uh, the book as well. It'll be up soon, and um, you know what I could do is probably send you a PDF. Oh, that'd be I'm great. I'm just hoping I, you'll see. Uh, yeah, that you'll see all the pictures. You know, with me and Mick and. Right, Jagger and all, all the all the guys that we toured with and everything else, and, and it's a pretty heavy book, by the way. When would the yeah, book be coming back out? If you're re-releasing it, when would it be coming back out? Do you know? Oh, uh, probably next week. Really, next that week. quick? Oh, okay, cool. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. This is um um a updated book that okay. I'm putting back out. Oh, now well, it's called Lollipop Lounge. Hey, so on the on the re-release of And I Mean It and Urban Desire, with this coming out, uh-huh. has, has this conjured up any unique feelings or forgotten memories that were tied to both of these albums? Has it stuff or anything new that, as far as feelings go, with that has come up uh, in my mind? Oh my God, mm-hmm. these these two albums have been on my mind forever. So, <laughs> and it, well, I don't know if you know the history of. <laughs> Oh my goodness! It's so hard to explain. It's all in my book, but um, the Urban Desire. All I remember is that Urban Desire, and I mean it, was climbing the charts. We were the most added album, us and Springsteen. Mm-hmm. Okay, and the record company folded in the middle of it climbing on the charts. Oh man! And there went my career, my life, everything. I was just so. I said, "That's it. I'm produced." I am no longer doing this, you know, and I was just so jaded at that point. But all I remember is it took a year to do Urban Desire because I was working on off time at Media Sound Studio. They were friends of mine, the owners. And, um, you know, I didn't want to take, you know, they wanted to give me the studio, and but I would have to do downtime. So it took a year to do that album. Right. So that was <laughs> that was amazing. And then, and I mean it, you know, there was already a budget and I could go in because I was on 20th Century Fox Records. They were still in motion. Mm-hmm. And um, and I mean it, uh, I got, that's when I got, um, let me see, Ian Hunter and Mick Ronson. Oh, wow. I was going to have this song, Junk Man, from And I Mean It. Uh, that was supposed to be Van Morrison and me. Oh, wow. And Van told me that he was on tour and he wouldn't be available for at least seven months. And I didn't want to hold up an album. Right. And just the same time that I was producing uh, and uh, performing the And I Mean It album at the studio, uh, in walks Mick Ronson. He says, what is that? And I said, oh, that's the song I'm doing called I Should Have Listened to the Junk Man." And I'm waiting for Van Morrison to see if he can, like, you know, at least fly in for the day. He goes, Genya. He said, let me, let me just tell you, Ian Hunter would love to do this song. And I said, uh, you know, I'm thinking maybe Springsteen or, you know, uh, I, I, let me give him a shot. Yeah. I gave Ian Hunter the shot and he did it perfectly, it just out. the way I wanted it. And so what was I going to do? You know, yeah, yeah. he did it. He did it with me. And, and boy, oh boy, did that get play and still does. Yeah. Well, uh, one, you know, so one, one question I had yeah. for you on all this is on your yeah. duet with Lou Reed, I Colorado. Is yeah. there any kind yeah. of unique backstory to this or anything that's not yes. commonly known about the, that recording with Lou? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, tell me, please. <laughs> okay. Well, well, okay. I was waiting for the okay because you can't shut me up, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, if he does, we're both going to be scared. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we'll both be sitting here killing time. Anyway, um, my my guitar player Richie Fliegler at the time was also working with Lou Reed, mm-hmm. and. 
when we did uh, I Colorado, I said, I, I don't know, but I think I want to do a duo with somebody on this. And already I was, you know, doing the CBGB bit. I was thinking, who would I get? Maybe the guy from Talking Heads, blah, 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 mm-hmm. blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. I said, no, I want someone scruffy and someone rough, and, you know, and someone street and wise and whatever. Then Richie says, you know, I did bring up to uh, Lou that you were doing an album. Let me see if he'd be interested. Well, that was a big yes. Yes, he's interested. Right. He walks into the studio, and I have the lyrics written out, and I'm I'm doing both parts, you know, uh, on the original. I'm doing both parts in the studio. I said, here's the notes. These, these are your parts. These are your parts. He goes, um, okay, so he's got the lyrics in front of him, and I said, look, let's make it easier. Let's both of us go into the studio. I'll have a mic on one side and a mic on the other, and we'll rehearse it. Now, my engineer knows me, and I said, no matter if someone sneezes, you record everything. Erase is much easier than redo. Yep, yep. You know? So I... I happen to love, you know, the reality of recording because I've been on both sides, like I say. Mm -hmm. So you really have to be the audience and everything else for an artist when they're out there performing. Very vulnerable people, and you want to keep it that way. Right. Okay, so we're in the same room, and I know the tape's running. Uh, Lou doesn't. (laughs) We run it down the first time. And when I tell you impeccable, he says, then he says, and when it's done, I look over at the engineer, he winks at me, and I went into the control room, and I said, just move on, hold on to that take, hold on to every take he does. So he says, okay, so we move on, and he comes in, He and I say to him, I say, uh, I love this, but he's an artist. He says, no, I could do this better. We did three more times, and as he was going, he tried to make it so right that he was doing it wrong, okay? (laughs) When I say wrong, it wasn't what I wanted. Right. I wanted that street rough talking, you know, uh, hey, and I'm getting so mean. I'm a Puerto Rican, and I'm getting so mean. He kept saying, I, Colorado, (laughs) like the state. It's not Colorado. It's Colorado, which in Spanish means red. It was about my boyfriend, Colorado who had red hair. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So anyway, to make a long story short, he never knew I kept the first track. And Uh when he heard it back after the mix, he goes, yeah, that was a good take. (laughs) So that's the backstory. All right. Well, I thought you'd enjoy that. I love it. What about, what about any of the other songs? Any, anything uh, unique that you would like to share in uh, with any of the other songs on the two albums? Oh, Jesus, they were all unique. You know, the uh, <laughs> Mick Ronson solo, and oh, yeah. um, it was so incredible. I, You know, if I'm producing, it's like directing a film, okay? I mm-hmm. pick the scenes. I pick the sound. And what happened was Mick went in, God bless his soul. He went in, and he. I let him, you know, because artists are so, if they're good, okay, and Mick is, they're so particular uh, that they overthink. Mm -hmm. And usually you get the best takes in the first three takes. Mm -hmm. The the Dead Boys was the first take. I mean, you know, if you could believe that, that's true. So the more you put pressure on an artist, say, well, let's do it again. That was good, but let's do it again. They always start start thinking. So I said to, I said, Mick, that was great. Let's just do another solo. We'll hold on to that. I had him do about three different solos, and I picked up the intro of one take, the middle of another, and the end of another. And he, he never knew. He never knew I did that. He heard it back, and he says, this chick knows what she's doing. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it was really, you know, to get it from him and, and Ian, uh, they were all glowing, you know, with that track. Mm-hmm. So that's what happened there. Um, let me see what else, what else happened? Oh, I changed engineers left and right all the time because, you know, when a guy, I hate to do this cause I don't lean on this man, woman shit. I was never into that. You know, right, I'm right. as strong as I am. 
and you either deal with it or you don't. I never think anything. But here I am, a, a woman producer, mm-hmm. and I'm dealing with guys that have worked big records, okay? So when I say work, they were the engineers of big records because I wanted the best engineers, you know? Right. right. So when they defy me, mm. I, I yell at them or I fire them. Mm-hmm. And they go, again, it's difficult to work with. Mm-hmm. That's the rumor that was going around. Now, I said, when a guy is in there and he doesn't like a certain sound and he, they, you know, change it without any hesitation, that guy knows what he's doing. But then is hard to work with. <laughs> and that is strictly male-female shit. That yeah. is. Yeah. And I never felt that. I had a girl's band and never felt that. Mm-hmm. You know, I was always self-sufficient. So uh, the, the Dead Boys had about, let's see, four different engineers, you know. So mm-hmm. the the Dead Boys were wonderful to work with because they were new and they, you know, Haley Crystal was, uh, you know, putting up the money for them. And we did it at Electric Lady. Uh, oh, wow. I threw out the Hells Angels. I said, this is not a party. It's a business. Get out. And the dead boys couldn't believe it. (laughs) So anyway, I said to the dead boys, you don't have a bass player and I will not record rock, punk, metal or anything without a bass player. Mm -hmm. And then I thought about an old buddy of mine at media uh, who was also a great engineer, uh, but I needed him for playing bass. So he played bass. And the dead boys loved it. But, you know, he wasn't going to go on the road with them. He just played bass for them. So he played on the album. They never gave him credit. They gave the new boy, when they got the new guy, the credit because he was going to go travel with them. Mm. Years later, guess what? Who it was, by the way, that I had on bass? Who? Bob Clearmountain. Whoa. Producer of, yeah, you know who he is. Yeah, yeah. Now the boys got crazy when he, <laughs> I got a call in Florida from Stiv. Didn't, didn't Bob Clear Mountain do any mixing? I went, what are you crazy? <laughs> Don't you remember anything? He was your fucking producer that you didn't put on your album. And now you're trying to get his name on. Come on. <laughs> you know, <laughs> funny so how that works. That was <laughs> that, that, that's a story and a half, you know, uh, <laughs> anyway. If you don't mind, I'd like to ask you about another song that's of this historical yeah. and also a historical importance, but it's not on these two albums. Mm-hmm. And that's um, okay. your, the, the, when you did Somewhere for West Side Story. What's your... What's your <laughs> oh, my God, you're going to laugh your pants off when you read the book on that one. <laughs> oh, God. It was so white. I hated it. I hated it. I mean, it's a great song in the movie. Uh-huh. But, you know, I said, oh, God, you know, do, okay, it was, that was the very first thing I recorded. We had Bernard Purdy on drums. We had, this was for Decca Records, Coral mm-hmm. Records with, you know, you know who was in the escorts, right? Yeah. Was Richard Perry. Yep. And, uh, you know, and all of his friends from college, Right. they were a college band. In other words, they would only perform like do things during their summer vacations, you know, so mm-hmm. uh, from college. Um, <laughs> God, you know, I, I thank God I was always in the right place at the right time. I, put, I worked for it, but I was always you know, so I get on Coral Records. I, Richard, I jumped up on stage at the Lollipop Lounge in Brooklyn, okay, mm-hmm. which is the name of my book. Right. And I never was on stage. I never sang through a mic. I never did any of that. And so I'm sitting around with my girlfriends, very, very uh, welcome back, Cotterish. And we're <laughs> sitting around and, uh, you know, and I'm drinking. And the more I drink, and I knew I could sing, but I, whoever thought it was going to be professional, I was, you know, I was doing cheesecake modeling, making mm-hmm. a lot of money doing that in the 60s, you know? Mm-hmm. So um, I, they're on stage and they're doing all the oldie songs that I love and that I grew up to, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, they're on stage and the girls, they, 
And I'm singing along, and then the girls that I'm with say, get up and sing, Goldie. And I said, no, I, I, no, I dare you, get up and sing, because uh, uh, I was singing along, you know? Mm -hmm. So I said, you dare me? Oh, that's all I need, you know, that's all I ever needed. And so I ran up towards the stage, and I'm pulling on Richard's jacket while they're playing. And he looks down at me, he goes, what? I said, I want to sing. He goes, could you wait till I'm finished with this song? I said, sure. <laughs> They're singing, you know. Mm -hmm. They were a singing group. They didn't right. play. They were a singing group. But there was players, you know. Right. So anyway, after after he gets off stage, he comes over to the table. And now I'm really soused, but loose enough, you know. <laughs> and um, one thing led to another. They fired their singer. They called me up. They wanted me to join them and that they were going to do a record. And I thought it was baloney. But mm -hmm. I went along with it because you never know. Right. So uh, I go to Richie's house and uh, we start playing songs. And I honestly, I was into R&B like crazy already, you know, but they're doing this white stuff. You know, when I say white, don't get me wrong. You know, I, I just wanted to do R&B. That's what I felt. And that's what I grew up to. But I did somewhere. I tell you something. I sound I. I I sound like a pigeon in heat, you know? It just doesn't sound good to me. I can't even listen to it. I sound like, you know, like I was drowning, like like someone was choking me. There's a place for us. It becomes fucking number one. Oh, sorry for cursing. That's okay. It becomes number one in Detroit, parts of Ohio, Canada. And I get a call from Death records uh, henry jerome who says guess what you're climbing up the charts did i know what the f that was i didn't know i didn't know what that was and i said oh god uh yeah and he says you gotta you're gonna do some hops in detroit i said hops what is a hop well, I'll tell you who's on there. It's Marvin Gaye and uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm mentioning all these great names, these R&B names. I said, I'll do it. <laughs> so <laughs> there I am at the airport, and a car comes to pick me up. In, this is in, in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And a car comes to pick me up. And don't you know it, I'm in the back, and I hear, and here's Goldie Zelkowitz with Somewhere. And I go to the driver, that's me, that's me. He goes, yeah, and I'm Elvis Presley. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody thought I was black, even though it was such a white song. <laughs> <laughs> so they didn't, he didn't believe me. He didn't believe me. <laughs> and it was playing, and I went, oh, my God, I'm on the radio. I, you know, that was the first time I ever heard myself on the radio, wow. you know? I really, really was still a refugee in my head as far as world, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it was a long, long, hard drive, baby. Yeah, well, it I, was. I, I, I had fun with it, but it was a long drive. Yeah. So, about, you know what I mean by a long drive? I mean, you know, not car wise, just right, a, no, a long I, drive. I mean, just I, to form a girls' band after that. And then, you know, anyway, that's the West Side Story song. Yeah. Very cool. Well, you, Somewhere was my first hit. <laughs> wow. So you're a trailblazer, yeah. obviously, in for women in rock. And I, I find it interesting. And I, I never get political on any of my stuff. If artists want to talk yeah. politics, that's up to them. But yeah. I just yeah. I, I I throw things right down the middle. But I find it interesting that for an industry that has mm -hmm. always touts itself for equal rights, ex, you know, all that kind of stuff. I know. That that the I music know. industry, especially rock and especially country. Absolutely. I know what you're going to say. And you're, why, oh, what's up with that? Yeah, what's ahead. your thoughts on that? Honey, the only thing I could think, I don't know if I could explain it better. The United States, okay, Music, rock and roll, don't want to screw their sisters or their mothers. <laughs> they don't want to go after that. So they don't accept the women as much as they expect, accept the guys in this country. 
Mm-hmm. And that bothered me because the minute we went to England, we were a hit. Mm-hmm. All my music sells great in the United States. I mean, in 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 England and all all over Europe, actually. Yeah. Right. You know, uh, Poland. Mm-hmm. I mean, I got an interview in Poland. <laughs> they called me from Poland, and they want me to come over to Poland because they find me to be like the queen of Lodz, which is where I was born. Wow. When they found out that I was born in their country. I mean, mm-hmm. now they want me to come over next year for a big festival, which I said, sure. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. I will go. But anyway, um, when I say they don't want to screw their own sister, okay, we were accepted in the bar scene, okay, and there were lines. I mean, we're talking lines around the block at the wagon wheel and the peppermint lounge and all that. But it took that it took forever to 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 have a record hit for us in the United States, and we never really had one. Mm-hmm. You know, we were we were word of mouth. Ahmed Erdogan just fell in love with us and that's how we met the stones and the arbors and all of them everybody that heard us said they discovered us <laughs> sure good discover me but i had to do it going to uh, another country that's the way that was okay an old girl band if i you know there are people with small minds i i don't know what it is i don't know what that is do you have any idea why that happened I think it just goes goes well, to I old don't. old old um just patriarchal type of stuff. I mean, whether it's women or any kind of minority, I, I you know, I think there's always been and I, I you know, and I'm I'm a white guy obviously, but I you know, and I yeah. think a certain amount of patriarchal, hierarchical type of thing. Uh-huh. And no matter what, uh-huh. human nature is such that there's always going to be a some form of discrimination. I, you know, we see it among white guys. There among, is, there always is. Yeah, I, and, I tell you, my best audiences be. were black audiences. Mm-hmm. You yep. know, and I we would we didn't want to work the South because at that time, no blacks were allowed in. Mm-hmm. I said, I'm not working in a place where there's no blacks allowed. Right. So it was us and the rascals. We never played the South. Wow, I wow. didn't want to. Yeah. Guess what? Guess yeah. who I'm talking to tomorrow? Oh. Felix Cavalieri. It'll be my third interview with him. Speaking of, oh it, my god! Oh my god! You got to hear what we did together on the uh, to undercover album. Tell me. Go ahead, talk to me. Uh, it's this song. Ah, uh, hello. Give me missing person. Listen, what is it that you need? You know that song? I've heard it. Yes. I say, oh, da da. No, you got to stop your pleading, because no matter where you go, yeah, you, you got to hear this. You got to. I can't wait. We we sound so cool together. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you're doing him tomorrow. That's yeah. wonderful. Well, it'd be my third give interview. Give him my him. love. I will. Uh, I definitely give will. Give him my you. love. Just Yeah, he's a great guy. I love Felix. So I have worked with them since Wagon Wheel, honey. You're talking about another bar band. They're another bar band. Where do you think they got their shit from? Oh, oh yeah. Man, <laughs> oh, man. Yeah. So, That's great. Well, you got good taste. <laughs> I like to think I do. So, on, on... Yeah, I think you do, baby. <laughs> you got me and then Felix tomorrow? Come on. There you go. Come on. It, it don't Give get any break. better than that. It, so. <laughs> <laughs> it don't get better than that. And you're talking to two people that came from the same place. That's, That's really right. ironic. That's right. <laughs> so on a scale from oh. one to ten, how much progress yeah. do you think has been made in the area of women in rock and roll, in country music? Do you feel like there's been any real progress at all? And if so, how much? I don't know about you, but. I don't think in rock and roll there has been too much progress. Mm -hmm. And I would be very, very, I'd be, this is the truth. I'm telling you, if I had a start today, I wouldn't do it. I would not go in both feet first anymore because this is now a real Wall Street business. Mm -hmm. It is now the copycats as most people in the music business are 
Mm-hmm. If Madonna's making it, let's get another Madonna. Nobody wants to work when they interview or review. Me, all I ever got was, she sounds like Janis Joplin. I was around before Janis Joplin. Right, you, you know, so, I mean, like, is it is it laziness that you can't come up? Do you not know who I am or what I do? Do you not, can you not put it in print what I do? You have to compare me and and because you don't know what to say. I don't understand it. You know, how many, how many Madonnas you want to sign? How many Janices do you want to sign? Yep. Now, when Clive Davis signed me to Columbia, it was after Janis left. He thought he was getting another Janis Joplin. Surprise! <laughs> you know? Yep. Yeah. Wow. But uh, anyway, yeah, it's it just, no, the industry, there is no industry, okay? Yeah. There is none. Look how long it took. For, I mean, for everyone to play any girl bands, any bands that that were all female. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, Fanny got a hit when? In the 80s. Yep. You know, I mean, yeah, they've been around. Quattro has been around. Uh, these girls have been around. But they didn't do what we did. Right. They didn't go where we did. I never saw them. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah. To, well, and to know, do all the female band said. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, it, this, you know, the business, the music business, there is no more music business, honey. There's people like you that do the press. Thank God for press. Mm-hmm. There'd be no music business. I'm telling you. You know how hard uh, it, people work to get anything played today or something. And when you say signs, forget about it. That's why I have that show with little Steven. Goldie's Garage is all about unsigned bands. That's all I'll play. Cool. I love that. You know, and the reason I do that is because there's no place for them to show their wares. Mm -hmm. And it's important that they hear themselves. It's important that they're talked about when, you know, when they're, when they deserve it. You know what I'm saying? And then my other show is Chicks and Broads with Little Steven, you know, that I play only women for an hour. Mm-hmm. All women. Okay. I'm talking about all women in music, mm-hmm. not genres, all women. Yeah. You know, so I play, let's say, I, you know, I play doo wop to a, a brand new garage girl band to, uh, you know, a classic. To, to, you know, to uh, Brenda Lee, mm-hmm. you know, and I, they, people love my shows, love my shows, mm-hmm. I have to tell you. So, you know, I mean, I'm trying right now in my later years, I'm trying to bring it into a, a, a place where, you know, bands have places to, to play and, and, and try you know now when cbgb closed down that was a disaster for a lot of bands yeah it was no it wasn't the greatest place to play but the sound system was good the stage was good and hilly took pride in what he had there Mm -hmm. and and if it wasn't for hilly and uh you know he hired me to do some you know productions for him right um and that's what i did you know i i so you know it all comes around, baby, I, with with people like yourself and, and, you know, all of the... But, you know, you got a clean house, too, because there's a lot of weirdos out there that want to, um, you know, interview. and Oh, yeah. You know, they're starting a podcast, and all of a sudden, it's like everybody... And I got to watch it, too, or else I'd be on the phone 24-7, you know what I mean? That's right. So that's why we got Carol Kay doing this, to, uh, you know, and I'm grateful to the record company, you know, well, Carol, for hiring someone like that. Carol's among the yeah, best. I worker. love working with her. She, I, she, I tell you a true story. You know story. what? She, she feels the same about you, honey. Oh, well, she I, feels the same too, about you. I got to tell you this story. Yeah, she said he's a great guy. She said he's a great guy. You're going to love talking to him. <laughs> so, you know. Well, I hope I, hope I, I haven't. I love talking to him. <laughs> I hope I haven't proved. <laughs> no, her no, role. no. You're keeping your rep. You're definitely keeping, <laughs> and then some. <laughs> oh, good. I got to tell you the true story about her, though. When I first heard about her, 
she was um, uh -huh. promoting an album of a friend of mine in Dallas. I lived in Dallas at the time is Andy Timmons. He used to be uh -huh. with danger danger and he's solo now. And he was, he was releasing a uh, album called Andy Timmons. The Andy Timmons band does Sergeant uh -huh. Pepper and it's an instrumental cover uh -huh. of the Sergeant Pepper album. And I uh -huh. saw that uh -huh. the publicist was Carol Kay. And I thought, I thought it was the Carol Kay from the Wrecking <laughs> Crew, the bass player, right? Yeah. So I reach yeah. out. To no, Kay. no, no, she's not. No, I know. she's not I'm, the same one. I know. Yeah. I, that's so how I ahead. found you out. Reached out. Go ahead. Yeah, I reached yeah. out to her and found <laughs> out. Nope, nope, not not the one in the same. Two no, no, Carol no. Kay yeah, Carol Kay, the bass player, is the best. Yeah, the yeah. Best. So that's how I that's yeah. how I come in contact with Carol and love her. Love Ricky. <laughs> they are great funny. people. <laughs> but yeah oh yeah ricky i love ricky he was uh you know he was on my icon album i had him singing with me oh wow i didn't realize you that know? very cool yeah well, i have a, I have a yeah, question yeah. from a good friend of mine he, we hang out together and he's a big um vinyl record collector and when he heard that i was going okay. to interview you he 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 wrote this i'm going to read it verbatim he said saw that the song yeah I Going Back was pulled by the producer due to songwriters Goffin and King's concerns over the altered lyrics. Then Dusty Springfield had yeah. a top 10 hit in the UK with it a few mm. months later. And he was curious what your thoughts were about that. Okay. That's not true, by the way. Oh, really? So, okay. Uh, no. I was working with Andrew Oldham, and we mm -hmm. cut the song. And, of course, I changed some of the lyrics. And the next thing I'm hearing is uh, she heard, Dusty heard I recorded it and went berserk. She said, I've been sitting on this song, Carol. And she even changed her lyrics, your lyrics. Carol King heard it and loved it. So I turned around, you know, this is my fault. I turned around to Andrew and I said, scrap it. I'm not putting it out. Mm. Fuck all of this let's look for something else so that was my fault nobody pulled it i pulled it ah okay i did yeah she was sitting on the song for about a year and nothing happened so carol king sent it to uh to uh, uh andrew Oldham. wow you know and said uh see if she'd be interested and i did i got interested in the song think i'm going back my version was really good, mm -hmm. you know, and and then I thought, you know what, I'm not going to go through this where I'm questioned about the lyrics, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so really that was my fault. And yeah, people think it was pulled, that Dusty pulled, no, no, I pulled it. So you could tell your friend that. Okay, he'll hear it. <laughs> So you, <laughs> you, in fact, I'll probably see him this week, but uh, you've got, oh, okay. you've got not one, but two shows on Sirius XM. Now, how did you pull that off? Tell right. me about those shows. You mentioned them a, a minute ago. Tell, talk, oh, tell fans well, about your Steven. two shows. Well, yeah, I'll tell you what, little Steven had brought up to Dan Near, you know, Genya would be great on, on uh, uh, you know, as a host, a hostess on, on one of my shows. So um, what happened was Dan Near um, got in touch with me and I said, oh, I've got some great ideas. And I met with little Steven. Uh, you know, we met at his offices. Yeah. And I said, what do you think? about a show called Chicks and Broads. It's perfect. It's so Sopranos, you know? I mean, but that's me. I That's me. <laughs> he goes, I love Chicks and Broads. That's great. So I had that show first, and we became, you know, he read my book. He says, he called me. He goes, thanks a lot. I stayed up a whole night. <laughs> <laughs> he says, I'm exhausted. <laughs> he couldn't put down the book. I've been, I heard a lot, I, a lot of people say that. Mm -hmm. Couldn't put down the book, you know? So anyway, I, I um, so I went to the offices always to record there in New York City. And um, then I had an idea. I said, geez, I think I'd like another show. He, oh, yeah. He said, you know, I was doing it like almost every day and I didn't want to be 
I was living upstate and, I, and it was a trip to get into New York City every day. Okay. I didn't want to work that hard, you know? So <laughs> I said to him, I said, what about I do uh, uh, two shows? I said, let me tell you what I'm thinking. He goes, what? And I said, this is at a meeting. And there's a lot of people sitting around. I go, I want to do a show for unsigned rock and roll bands. Um, and uh, and I don't know what I'll call it yet. Uh, and it was Stephen that said, Goldie's Garage. I said, really, Goldie? Really? Yes. Keep the name alive. Wow. And that's how that happened. But I was, those are my two ideas to do those two shows. So we broke it down to where I will do two shows a month. It's a lot of work, the Goldie's Garage. It's not only do I get, like, constant MP3s. I mean, daily (laughs) MP3s. I could be booked for the next 10 years with Goldie's Garage. That's how much music I'm hearing. Great, great bands from all over the world. I get it from Germany. I get it from Australia. I get it from... Japan, I'm getting it from everywhere. They all know about Goldie's Garage, and they all want a shot. And uh, it's an hour show. I put in 13 tracks, so I talk fast. Wow. wow. That's, that's <laughs> yeah, hard to cram and that's 13. how that happened. And little Steven is the best. He's, you know, he gave me my, my magic carpet ride. I, I love playing <laughs> other artists, you know, just like I love jamming with artists. And you only get that from working clubs, babe. That's yep. where you get it from. Always jamming. You know, it was so easy to sit in with bands those days because they were doing cover songs. Yeah, yeah. Today, I get up there, I go, you know, Eye of the Needle? That was 10-wheel drive. How are they going to know that chart? <laughs> Nobody, you can't sit in with, with, with songs you just wrote with bands. Right. Do you yep. get what I'm saying? Yep, I do. I mean, there was. I come from the bands that played seven shows a night. <laughs> and we'd switch back and forth, like me and the Rascals, okay? Goldie <laughs> and the Gingerbreads and the Rascals, constantly. You know, they'd go on for 40 minutes, we'd go on for 40 minutes. They'd go on for 40 minutes, we'd... And we always... There were lines outside the streets. That's how I got found by Mike Jeffries and the Animals. They had, number one was um, House of the Rising Sun. Right. You know, and I loved it, you know? But anyway, we're playing, and I'm playing tambourine, and... uh and Mike Jeffries, the manager of uh, the animals, and Eric Burden and Hilton Valentine are walking down the street in Times Square because that's where they were playing, mm-hmm. uh, some theater there. And they heard a tambourine. And I don't have to tell you, Eric is, uh, loves black music. He loves, he loves. And they're thinking they're hearing a chick that, that's black with a rocking band. They come in and they get floored. <laughs> it's a woman's band they're listening to. And not only that, they're white. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. And so the next thing, huh? I said, oh, yeah, no. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, the next thing, yeah, oh, my God. I mean, the next thing is Mike Jeffries keeps coming back and sits down and talks to me and says, uh, well, you know, we'd love to take you over to England. And I said, I'm there. <laughs> I'm there. I said, uh, yeah, you know, I made all the decisions for the Goldie and the Gingerbread. If I left it up to the girls, they would have never left New York City. Oh, man. You know, yep. and I I wanted a flourishing. That's why I kept changing girls all the time in, in Goldie and the Gingerbread. The minute one would say, well, I, I you know, I'm pregnant. Well, get the fuck out of the band. <laughs> you know, I can't take you and your child on the road. And we were managed by the roadies. mob. Baby, you got to read my fucking book. I can't I tell you my it. whole life story. I know. And that's I... what I'm doing. I'm telling you my whole life story here. <laughs> I'm not complaining at <laughs> what all. What an interview. Good. <laughs> I'll be cool on my next interview. All right. <laughs> I'm not going to sit there. Well, you, you wrote a book and you've had a play about yeah. your story and this yeah. other project that yeah. we're editing now. A musical. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah, Yes. And another other, book coming out. Yeah. And this other project you told me that we can't have on air yet because of, but is right. anything contractual, right? Right. Is there anything else you would like to do or what would you like to see done in the next five years, especially when it comes to women in rock music? 
Yeah. I would have to say that today there's a lot of female rock and roll bands. Mm -hmm. They're not going to have a problem. They're going to get, you know, and they are slowly but surely, you know, they are going to get their slice of the music. But what's going to happen with the industry with them? I don't know. It's not easy. Today, you, you, you know, you have to have the dancing and the ba and the ba. ba. It's not just music. Yeah. You know, today you really, really, it's so difficult. What I'd like to see is more clubs open, yeah. more live shows, more, you know, not the kind where, you know, holds 5,000, 10,000, 50,000. I'd like to have little clubs open up so groups have places to play and hone their art. Yeah. You know, and yes, keep writing, but, you know, also do some covers so that, you know, it was uh, a smaller business. OK, it got so out of hand. It, it, you know, Jay-Z is doing great. Jay-Z is pushing like crazy. He's taking his money and putting it where his mouth is. And if I had money, I'd be putting it where my mouth is, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know. I'm one of the I'm one of the acts that got screwed over, you know, just like everybody else did in the 60s. Yeah. You know, trying to collect my money now is like, forget it. I know what they were making now that I'm getting my own residuals. Yeah. I know what they were making. We got so ripped off, so ripped off. That's and 10 wheel yeah. drive. I, I couldn't keep my group 10 wheel drive because you can't travel with 15 people. And try to come home with any kind of money. Yeah, too expensive. Not when you don't have a hit record. Right. No, agreed. Agreed. It, you know, so honestly, the business ate itself up. I'd like to see it go back to the 60s, where there were clubs on every freaking street. Groups could play and hone their art. Another CBGBs where, you know, it didn't matter as long as you were good. Mm-hmm. Didn't matter if you drew anybody as long as you're good. He had empty houses half the times with half of these groups playing who went and turned out to be super groups. Blondie. Yep. Talking Heads. Mm -hmm. You know, television. Mm -hmm. They all became stars, but they had a club there where you could be seen and heard. That's right. There's no A&R people out there anymore. Nope. What I'd like to do is start my own freaking label, like I did once. Yep. Well, that's but I'm not under the, the influence. It, it, I have 31 years, darling, sober and clean. Very good. Congratulations. That, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my partying days, I partied out, <laughs> you know. Hence, you know, making a lot of mistakes and going with the wrong people. You know, just um, I had to get clean and take time off the business before. I would start again. And today, I, you know, I take it easy. I have to, you mm -hmm. know, I mean, I have, I'm, I'm getting up in age and I, listen, my head wants to boogie, but my body don't let me, you know, I feel it's your like pain there. <laughs> <laughs> I have sciatica, which I heard is not an old person's uh, uh, symptom at, at all. My back from performing. And I lost a little bit of my hearing, but that's been going ever since uh, I've been on stage with Marshall Lamps, you know. Right, so. right. But I still hear enough to make good records, baby. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not going to overwork myself anymore like I did. But you yeah. know what? If I didn't do what I did, I wouldn't have what I got. There you go. You know? There you go. One, yeah. one more so question. So what do I want? I, I, I want to see it go back to the 60s now. Is that asking a lot? No, it, yeah. I, I think we all would love that, <laughs> at least from a music I know. perspective, you know, except better accounting. Exactly. Go back to the 60s, oh, man. better accounting. Yeah, you know, Rumbar uh, uh, Records in, in Boston uh, and also the label I'm with, they're starting off, they're doing great. Mm -hmm. You know, they're pushing acts, they're doing, you know, they're doing what they're supposed to be doing. That reminds me of the old days. Yep. Yep. Okay. When you, so it's the big guys that ate the business up, ate it up. Yep. You know, I went to my. I wanted to do a cartoon 
of uh, Donald Duck walking into uh, an A and R office <laughs> with a record, and the uh, the guy sitting behind the desk is Porky, and <laughs> uh, Porky goes, "It doesn't kill me," and then. The duck pulls out a gun. He says, well, this will. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I, that's a silly, silly thing. You don't have to put that in. <laughs> it's a silly I, thing. But I used to hate to hear that. It doesn't kill me. No. It doesn't kill you. <laughs> Not me. No, when I was producing bands, you know, <laughs> like I brought in a group called Rosie, who oh, fucking incredible, to RCA. And uh, it was because I was working for them for other acts that they said okay but they heard them and they fell in love with that record yeah they signed them right away so i mean like you know at least people listened yep that's you right. know that's they right. listened yeah well yeah. i have oh one there's more... so much this go ahead go ahead yeah go ahead babe no no I no no, no, no. One... Go ahead. i was going to ask you one more question but i want to hear what you were about to say go ahead that, that me and uh I came up with my saying, my T-shirt, who do I f to get off this label? Uh, <laughs> only because of RCA. Because <laughs> my 20th century records went to RCA, a label that both me and uh, and um, Lou Reed, yeah, and Lou Reed hated. Mm. Hated. We didn't want to be on there. We didn't want to be on there, and I wound up there. And I went, uh, and I was having an interview, me, Frank Zappa, and and uh, Robert Klein, the uh, the comic. Yeah. And I walked into the uh, room where all the heads of uh, <laughs> all the heads of RCA are there, and and one guy uh, was flirting with me, and I looked at him, and I, I, he was one of the head guys, and I said, "Who do I f to get off this label?" <laughs> 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 That's how that started. Oh, <laughs> he looked at me and laughed so hard, <laughs> you know, and anyway, that was my T-shirt. I could have made money on just selling those T-shirts. Well, Polish Records is no joke. That was the name of my label, Polish. <laughs> and in the back it said, who do I to get off this label? <laughs> and my artists loved it. They loved it. I sent out little jock straps <laughs> to... Um, to all the DJs and said, support Polish records. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I had a great campaign. I had a great, and it was all my idea. I love marketing. I love mm. marketing. It's you should have seen the marketing for, uh, oh my God, for Urban Desire. Oh my God. Let's see if you could Google it. Just, okay. I had a guy who looked like he was jerking off behind my album that says, Everyone's excited about Kenya Raven's Urban Desire. <laughs> oh, <no>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was heavy. It was pretty heavy, and it was my idea, and they went for it. Oh my goodness! But like they, it was on buses. It was on buses in Manhattan. <laughs> I I was embarrassed when I walked down the street. I see buses with my, you know, with this guy who I find out later is from uh, porn. He was a porn guy, oh. and my photographer grabbed him and said, "Come on, we got a we got a treat for you. My album is in front of his crotch, and he's jerking off. Oh, <laughs> you Lord. can't see him jerking off, but you know that's what he's doing. Right. That's where his hand is. Oh my goodness. Okay, I'm going to send you that shot. It's in my book as well. So, okay. but right. the campaign for that was killer. The trains, the train." Trains didn't want to have it on their, uh, in, in their <laughs> I can't station. imagine why. So. <laughs> it was banned. It was banned. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. The controversy Everyone's sells. getting excited about Urban Desire. Right. <laughs> <laughs> One-liners that flood the it mind. It was great. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So one, one more question. Anyway. I, I, go, I, go ahead, I, baby. I have one more question for you, and that's uh, I ask artists this have been around for a while, and I hope are going to be around for a okay. long time more. And it's not meant to be a dark kind of question at all, but um, okay, but you know it gets us to thinking about you know what we do with our life and such. And that is, and I borrow yeah. a line from Pink Floyd on this: is when you step off the tour bu bus of life up at the great gig in the sky, how do you want to be, right, ever, right. and what do you hope your legacy is? You know, anyone that knows me will remember me. And my legacy is my music mm -hmm. from Urban Desire to Ten Wheel Drive to Goldie and the Gingerbreads. We made a lot of noise 
And those were my families. My records are my kids. And they're because I gave up a lot for this industry. And one of them was having a family and marriage. Forget about it. A guy doesn't want to know uh, from a chick that's on the road all the time, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I was promiscuous. I had a good time. The 70s were good to me. Mm-hmm. <laughs> anyway, and you were good uh, yeah, to them. <laughs> I, I just, I want to. I was good to them too, yeah. <laughs> but I, I want to be remembered for my music and the, you know, the get up and go, you know, is there until I die. So my get up and go is, and I hope I, uh, yeah, I'll be jamming from heaven, you know? Yep, yep. Uh, where all the other musicians I love are. Yep. And, uh, you know, I, I do have to tell you, I, I also got weaned on all kinds of music, not just R and B. I got weaned on um I don't know if you ever heard him, King Pleasure. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I do Moody's Mood for Love. Wow. I do Red Top. I do all of that jazz stuff too. I mean, you know. Wow. Yeah. I am a performer and I am a singer and they always try to put to put corner me. Mm-hmm. You're either, that's what Phil Spector said to me, too. He goes, well, what are you, a singer or a producer? I said, wake up, Phil. It's the 80s, man. I do it all. I hate you know, <laughs> don't corner, don't pigeonhole me. Yeah. You know, yeah, I'm a producing singer and a great person, you know? Yeah. So anyway, that was when I was producing Ronnie. He wanted to come in and produce with me i said no way he would have taken over you know and no, no i wasn't gonna, about to do that you know no. so i said no yeah well, Genya, well, this was anyway. a ton of fun i want to interview you more in the future it, uh, you know just absolutely about, honey i want to talk to you about your life in the future and have some fun with it and then anytime you have uh, anything, absolutely you know, when this book comes uh, back uh, out and when you're when when this other any other projects almost slip anything in. that happens i promise you i promise you you'll be one of the first people that'll know i appreciate that because i would that, love I to promise talk to you. you and i am going to stay in touch with you for sure please do and you hold on to my numbers i will i will and i'll tell i'll okay. tell carol what a great time we had and you tell her too and we'll just we'll just <laughs> oh, visit i am, on I am gonna tell her that she was <laughs> right you are adorable well yeah. thank you very much as, as are you and i look forward to talking <laughs> to you more in the future my door is always open to you i'm i'm gonna be sending you some stuff today baby All right. I love it. Thank you very much. Let's stay in touch. Okay, love. All right. All right. You bet. Bye-bye. This show was edited and produced by Mike McClellan. The original music, Roll the Dice, was written and produced by Quentin Hope. And Randy Patterson was your host and executive producer.